You know, that's really what it's about. Amen. How are we impacting this community? If all we ever do is come and learn, I mean, learning is important because we need to have something to go and take to them, Amen. take to the world. But if all we ever do is just come and have a bless me club and sit around and, and preach to one another and, 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 and shout hallelujah, but we don't actually do anything with it, man, we're wasting our time. There are people that, that need the word of God. And, and, and some, people, some people say, well, well I'm, not, you know, I'm not Smith Wigglesworth. <laughs> well, not many people are, thank God. <laughs> Amen. That was a big guy. <laughs> but you know how he got started in ministry? Most people know Smith Wigglesworth just from the books and the miracles and all those th- the, the things they hear. But, but yeah, he's just a plumber. He wasn't a Christian. He wasn't serving God. He got, got, got to, uh, once he gave his life to the Lord through his wife, he uh, uh, started, he would just go to work every day. And when he took his, his lunch break, he'd take an hour lunch break. And so he just made a practice. He'd go out on the street during his hour lunch break. He's not in full-time ministry. He's not being asked to go to Australia or to the U.S. and pray for the masses. They're not asking him to pray for nobody. He hasn't even, he hasn't even led the meeting yet at, the, uh, at the, the, the meeting where they'd get together and they'd pray for the sick. And he, would go, he started going to that, but he hadn't, been, he hadn't prayed, prayed for nobody. And the way he got started was on his lunch break. He'd go out there and just stand on the street corner and he'd just pray. And he'd ask the Lord, Father God, who, I don't know exactly what he prayed, but he'd, he prayed to the effect of something. God, who, should I, who, who can I bless today? Who would you have me share with today? Who would you have me tell the word today? And he'd just do that. And he'd do that every day. He'd say that for an hour. Until the Lord showed him somebody walking down the street. And then he'd go and talk to him about Jesus. And share with him and minister the, the love of God to him. Before. Why? Because he just had a heart to tell people the truth. To lead people. To, to, to minister what had been freely given to him to freely share with others. Amen. I heard a testimony one day he was out there doing that. And uh, uh, he, he was out on the street and he was waiting. And the guy said that it was getting pretty close to uh, uh, the hour being about up. And he had about four or five minutes left. And he thought, well, this is usually the Lord shows me somebody, but now I haven't seen anything. And so he says, he, Lord, are you ever going, are you going, what's the deal here? Are you going to show me who you, who you want me to pray for today? What do you want me to do? I got to go back to work here in just a minute. And just about that time, there was a cart going by and a guy was up in a cart and kind of like Philip, he, he went up and hopped in the cart and just started telling the guy, he said, hi, how you doing? My name's Smith Wigglesworth and I want to tell you that Jesus loves you and just began to minister to him. And as soon as he said, Jesus loves you, the guy says, ah, I don't want to hear about that blimey, you know, <laughs> that Jesus stuff. Get out of here. And he just started telling him, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you what he's done for you. How he, how, how he bore you know, your sin and how he died for you and, and, and what the, the redemption and the things that's him and Christ. And the guy got mad and, you know, was cussing at him. And about the time that he was about to push him out of the, the, the carriage, you know, that he jumped off the cart and went back on his way. But he preached him the message. And then the, I, I heard the, it was, it was a British guy that said the story. So I'm assuming it's true. I don't know if it's true. I don't have it on documentation. But I heard the guy, uh, the, the preacher say it. And he said that uh, he had, uh, that night, a message had come through to the door and that it was from a, a doctor in town. And that the doctor had said that this guy, that, that, you know, he said, hey, did you minister to such and such? Um, some guy in a cart today? And he said, yeah, I did. Yeah, shoot your bet. And he said, well, you know, he, he died, went on, <laughs> went on to be with the Lord. But before he did, he, he was sure to tell me, he says, I want you to find this guy named Smith Wigglesworth. And you tell him that I did what he, t- what he told me and I gave my life to Jesus. And then he said, the doctor said that the guy went on home and died. So you never know. Amen. But it always pays to just be faithful to preach the word of God. Mark B- Brzee said that, uh, um, he said, when God's compassion flows, miracles happen. When we just allow our hearts to be touched and not think about ourselves, but think about just other people and the brokenness of humanity, miracles happen. That's when it begins to flow 
And, we, and, and that's, that, that's, who knows what we'll see. In, in Matthew 14, 14, it said Jesus was moved with compassion. There were multitudes. He healed all because compassion. Miracles begin to happen. Healing power freely begins to flow. Right. Just by allowing yourself to be moved, to minister the light, word of truth and life to other people. Amen? Well, praise God. <laughs> Why don't we open our Bibles? Let's go to... Uh, we'll go to... Let's go to 1 Corinthians 13. We're going to see more and more and more and more uh, uh, healing, more testimonies of what God's done. Uh, Bob was telling me this uh, just before service that he went to the, they took a, a picture of his eyeball and the, that his eyeball had been, been in, had been messed up. They said it was having det det detached retina and that they went back and they said, it looks good to me. L looking normal. Looking good. Amen. <coughs> Praise God. Why? Because God is a healing God. He is a healing God. Healing has not stopped. Healing has not passed away. It hasn't changed. Amen. I don't care what the symptoms say. I don't care how you feel. It doesn't matter. Sometimes you don't feel necessarily healed, but how we feel has nothing to do with it. And there are people out there that don't even know that Jesus bore sickness and disease and those things in his body. And, and they're not going to receive healing unless they know. And so we need to be convinced and we need to be in a place where we're, where, where we're solid in that reality. Why? Because from that confidence will come to minister not just uh, the, the gospel, but the, the full gospel, including health and healing. That's part of the package. It says in Romans chapter 1 that the, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. One, uh, uh, one translation says that the gospel is God's power. That it's God's power bringing salvation. The gospel that word salvation, we've heard it many, many times before. In the Greek, it's the word soteria. And it's kind of an all-encompassing type of word. And it doesn't just mean going to heaven, but it means, it means talking about redemption. It encompasses the idea of, of, of fullness, being made whole. Yes, it encompasses the idea of health and healing. You could say the gospel of God is the, or the, the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto provision. Because it talks about fulfillment, it talks about being sustenance, the word soteria. The, the gospel is the power of God unto healing. That the gospel is the power of God unto a, a physical health. Praise God, unto being rescued, unto deliverance. It says, unto safety. The gospel is the power of God unto safety. It's the gospel message. The gospel message. And healing is encompassed in that. I'm going to be stuck on healing just as much as I can uh, um, when, I, when I speak. Uh, just because something the Lord told me uh, er earlier this fall. And uh, 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 I want to see it. Amen. He told me that it was harvest time for healing. I said, praise God. So I'm going to just start preaching on healing. Just every chance I get. So in thinking about that idea of healing. And thinking about those things. I just thought it was good to revisit what we don't believe. We don't hear too many, script, too many sermons about what you don't believe. But I just want to talk about what we don't believe. Tonight. Why is that important? Well, here's why I think that's important. Because people constantly tell me all the time what I'm supposed to believe. The world tells you. The TV tells you. The radio tells you. Your friends tell you. This is what you should believe. This is what you should believe. And by converse, they're telling you what you shouldn't believe. And so sometimes I just like, 
I just think that we ought to just do stuff just a little bit different, just to remind ourselves, just, just a little bit flavor, so it might stick. At least that's how I work. I try to look at things backwards. <laughs> Amen. You hear it frontwards so long, look at it backwards. So let's just look at what we don't believe. One thing we don't believe is that healing has passed away. Some people will tell you healing's passed away. Some people will say that healing's not available today. They'll assent to the fact that Jesus was healer. They'll assent to the fact that he performed miracles, that there were healings that took place. But as far as today, based on what they see, based on what they think, based on what maybe things they've heard, they believe that healing has been done away with. One of the scriptures that people use to try to say that at least people that preach the Bible that try to say that the healing's passed away, is out here in 1 Corinthians 13, 10. And it says in verse 10, But when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part will be done away. That's the scripture they use. They, they use that to say, well, th- that we have now what is perfect because we have the Bible. And that this is the thing that is perfect. And so that when, when that which is perfect has come, That which was in part has been done away. So they'll say, because we have the word, because you have the Bible, all those things that you read about in it aren't valid anymore. Well, that's just dumb. I mean, you would think because you have the word, even more so. I like to read things in context. I'm a, a firm believer of that. And so when I just read through here, you look at verse 12. Verse 12 says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. See, again, people talk about, they think they're talking about the Bible. Well, it's not that. That can't be that because it it was like another 300 years before the Bible was even compiled into one text. And when, when Paul was writing this letter to the Corinthians, he wasn't thinking about a, a, an assembled multitude of manuscripts. He's writing them a letter. Amen? He's just writing them this letter. And here in, in that verse 12, he says, when, that uh, now we see dimly. Now we're not seeing the full picture. And I think when you look over in, in 3 John, or 1 John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, it says, now we see dimly. It says, now I, I don't see the full picture, but when I see Jesus as he is, then I will be like him. Then I'm going to be like him. Now we, it says, now beloved children, it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he shall be revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he he is. Why? Because when we see him now, we still see him dimly. When we look at Jesus, when we read the word now, when we pray and, 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 and the Father speaks to us and the Holy Ghost ministers to our hearts, our understanding of his grace, of his mercy, of his love is totally just still undone. We don't have a grasp fully of who he is. Because I'm still seeing dimly. It's still not lit. I still don't see the whole image. I still don't get, I get a glimpse. I get a picture. I get an image. But it's not crystal clear just yet. But praise God, when I see him, then... I will see crystal clear. Then, it says, I will be like him. When that which is perfect has come. When that which is perfect has come, we won't see dimly anymore and those things shall be put away. Well, that which is perfect hasn't come. Not again. Because well, I, I still need help. <laughs> I'm seeing him dimly. Thank God through the light of his word we can see him more clearly every day. We can learn and grow up more like him. But healing hasn't been done away. That's the only scripture that people try to use. 
I mean, I guess they might try to use a couple others. The biggest thing they try to use is experience. Well, you know, it's hard to, if all you ever do is believe your own experience, well, I was sick and I, and, and I never got healed. Were you even believing God in the first place? Well, my, my, our point isn't to argue, but we have to be convinced that healing has not passed away. We have to be convinced. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Pastor Virgil uh, preached a masterpiece on Sunday of simplicity. I mean, it was just, I, I was, I, I was, abs- it was just wonderful. A wonderful, wonderful, incredible message out of, first, out of John chapter 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Then jumping down to verse 13, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And this just took the, this very simple message that is full of profundity, that is full of just, 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 just such depth, and the, the thinking about the tabernacle and how just on the outside, just, it just looked like plain Jane, you know, camouflaged to fit in the desert. But on the inside was pure gold. And in the midst of that pure gold with all these articles and things was the very presence of God. But from the outside, nobody had any clue. Nobody would know how when Jesus came, That they're in the body of that babe. Looking like another babe. Looking like any old baby. Was God. And that in you and me. Looking like everybody else on the street. Is God. That he's in there. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday. Today. And forever. He hasn't changed. Forever hasn't come. And he's still the same. Praise God. Exodus 15, 26 introduced us to God as our healer. He is Jehovah. I am the Lord who has healed thee. Who healeth thee. Healing was a, is a big part of New Testament ministry. Without healing in the New Testament, man, it's a pretty short book. It really is. When you just read the specific miracles of Jesus, the specific miracles of Jesus, there are 36 specific miracles of Jesus. When I say specific, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about the ones where it says, you know, a person's name, blind Bartimaeus, okay? Uh, um, or, or the water turned to wine there at Cana. The fish and the bread, Okay? Specific miracles. 36 specific miracles in the New Testament. 26 of them are healing. That's over 72%. And I'm not counting the places like in Matthew 4 or in in, in Matthew chapter 8 or in Matthew chapter 10 or in Matthew chapter 14 where it says, and he healed all who were present. In Mark chapter 4, it says, that's that's that one where he, he jumped in the boat. There in Mark chapter 4, remember, there was a a crowd of multitudes. It says they had heard about the healings that he had wrought. And so on the beach, they came and they crowded around the shore. So he borrowed a boat and they said, can we push this boat out a little bit? And he began to preach to them there. And it says there in Mark chapter, I'm going to flip over there and read this. Mark chapter 4. I take that back. Mark chapter 3. There it is. You can read the whole thing, but verse 10 says, For he healed many, so that as many as had afflictions pressed about him to touch him. He had to get in the boat because he was being mobbed. I'd say mobbed to death, but he... (laughs) He was being mobbed worse than Justin Bieber in a a room full of teenagers. (laughs) 
They had heard about those healings and they're pressing in. He just been, he says, they had seen the miracles, they had heard about those healings and now we're, we gotta get some. We're gonna get some. That same Jesus, the same yesterday, today and forever. Healing hasn't passed away. And say, well, well but, but peop, some people will say, well, but in the Old Testament, God didn't heal in the end Old Testament. Well, that's not true. God regularly and consistently healed folk in the Old Testament. Regularly. In Deuteronomy chapter 7. I like this one. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, it talks about because of covenant. The Lord your God will keep with you the covenant. That's verse 12. And mercy which he swore to your fathers. And he will love you and bless you and multiply you. That's all good stuff. He will bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your land, your grain and your new wine and your oil, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flock and the land which he swore to your fathers to give you. He shall bless be above all peoples. So far he said this, that because of covenant, he loves you, he blesses you, he increases you. He said he'd bless your kids. It's in there. He said he'd bless your business. He said he'd bless your possessions. He'll increase your investments. And then verse 15 says, And the Lord will take away from you all sickness. All sickness. Why? Because of covenant, he said. Thank you, Lord. Hebrews tells us we have a much better covenant. A better covenant on better promises. So if all those things were available through covenant in the, old, in the Old Testament, then under the New, even much more. Even much more. We saw where uh, uh, in Exodus 23, he, there's healing there. Psalm 107, 20. Psalm 103, 3, not forgetting our benefits, but He forgives all of our iniquities. Over and over and over and over again. Psalm 30, I cried out to you and you healed me. Amen. He also says that in Psalm 107, 20, it's a different text and it's a different person that's writing it. But that's two of them. Praise God. Psalm 105, he healed million, you know, anywhere from one and a half to three million people all at one fell swoop. I think, imagine that healing line. How'd that happen? They ate the Passover. How'd that happen? They ate the Passover meal. And it says, when they left Egypt, there wasn't one sick or feeble among them. Jesus Christ, the one who brought God out where we could see Him, where we could get the flavor for who God is, it says in Hebrews chapter 1. Not in those exact words. <laughs> so that He was in that, the pattern of God. Why? So, he could see, so we could see Him. has never changed. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Not one time did Jesus ever make anybody sick. Not one time. I always have made people say, well, well maybe God put this sickness on me. There's n Jesus never made one person sick. And they always want to use some of the Old Testament scriptures and things. Well, hey, before you go there, you better be a Hebrew scholar. Because there's some, there's some interesting stuff in the Hebrew that they, they, they could be translated exactly the... I mean, there really are. When you go and study some of those things where it says that God made you sick, it's, it's, a, it's a reflexive type thing. It's kind of like weird Spanish. Where like the plate dropped itself. The plate fell on me. No, it didn't. You dropped it, you dummy. It didn't, <laughs> it didn't just fall off the table. You knocked it off the table. But you say, say, Kaye, the, the, the plate, it fell. Well, there's, 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 there's a lot of, that's common in many different languages to use that kind of sentence structure. And, and that's also available in the Hebrew. So it's very easy to say, and, we're, and God brought the sickness on it. It says, and the sickness came upon them. That even have to have anything to do with him. Anyway, that's a whole other idea and a whole other sermon. <laughs> but the whole point is, is that 
God's not making people sick. How do I know? Jesus never made one person sick. And it specifically tells us that he came so that we could see who God is. So we could see the character. So we could see the nature. So we could see the heart of who the Father is. Jesus never went to the guy with, he never found anybody with a withered hand and said, oh, let me help you out here and, and shrivel up the other guy's hand. So Amen. So he's got two matching hands. No, he always did to the better, to the benefit to the profit, to the blessing, to the healing of the individual. Not one place that ever Jesus leaves somebody worse off than they came. Now some people left Jesus sad. He never left them worse than they came. I'm thinking of the, the rich guy that came to Jesus. And he said, oh, I just want to, what, what does it take to inherit the kingdom of God? And he says, well, you've, if you've done all these things, it goes down the list of all the commandments. He says, yeah, I've done all those things. One thing you lack, you, you personally, you need to sell all you have and give it to the poor. And it says, that guy went away sad. Jesus was trying to help him. He said, your money owns you. Life's living you. You're not living life. Your life is controlling you. I want to help set you free. So we don't believe that, that uh, um, healing's been done away with. We've got a much better covenant. We can, there's all kinds of other places. I love Genesis 20 where he healed Abimelech and all his concubines. And they set them all free. Amen. We don't believe that God wills some people to be sick goes right along with that. Jesus is the will of God in action. Jesus said himself in John 14, 9, He who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus went about doing good, healing all. We have to remind ourselves of these simple, simple truths. Because every single day I hear Christians say things. That, that caused me to have stress right up my back right here. <laughs> they, I mean, Jan will could contest to it. They call on the telephone. They won't come to church, but they'll call on the telephone. I came to your church, I think, once, maybe like nine months ago. And I need, I need prayer about this. And she'll begin to, to, to minister to them and talk to them and try to build their faith. Well, you think God, well, if God's doing this to you, then why are you asking me to pray for you? I mean, I, I don't, I want to, if you really think God's doing this, then I don't want any part talking to you. <laughs> I'm going to stay away from you. <laughs> oh, yeah, my, my, is it contagious? <laughs> well, we don't believe that, that God wills people to be sick. But if you're not careful, you will uh, hear those little seeds and those little things that people begin to say. And I don't mean that you need to just jump down their throat. That's not what I'm, say, I'm trying to condone. I'm not saying that at all because there needs to be a place of compassion for the individual and the circumstance of where they're at, the understanding of where they're at because you want to come alongside and begin to try to help walk with them to a place where they can see the truth and they can see the real reality. Why? Because their eyes are dim. And your eyes might be dim too, but you got a little bit better vision when it comes to Jesus in the healing department. So what do we want? We want to help them to move over closer into that light where they can see the reality of who He is better so they can receive the blessings and the promises that He has for them, including health and their healing. We don't believe that God's capricious. We don't believe that God just does whatever He wants to do whenever He wants to do it. That's another one that, that becomes easy to, to allow your, your mind to start shifting that direction if you don't just stop it. Because everybody all around, they begin to think, well, I don't know, God just did this. God must have done that. Well, I prayed to God and nothing happened. It must be God's will. Well, just because you prayed to God and it didn't happen doesn't mean it was God's will. Amen. 
There's a lot of people dying and going to hell, and that's not God's will. God's not capricious. He's not spinning the wheel of misfortune. <laughs> yeah, he's not, he's not running around taking people. He's not spinning a wheel of misfortune. But that is the flavor of God that the world has. And it's the same flavor that has infiltrated many, many, many in the body of Christ and in the church. And that's not his heart. And we have to stay concrete on those thoughts and on those ideas. Why? Because it only takes one little place. The scripture says it's not the foxes that destroy the vine. It's the babies that come along. They can't reach the fruit, so they nibble on the thing. And it's these little things that we allow ourselves to, 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 to hear, that we allow our, over time, if we don't just stay Go back to the truth. Go back to the reality and just concrete it over and over and over and over and over again that we'll begin to, tra- we'll begin to conform to that place. We'll begin to, not, to, 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 to lose that firm grip that we once had. Scripture says, tighten the grip. Strengthen those feeble knees. And the world needs us to have a tight grip on the gospel of his love. That it brings freedom. That it brings truth. That it brings healing. That it brings indeed deliverance. Amen. We were out in the park on Sunday. And I was, I was walking down the line. I was just kind of walking down the thing, talking to some folk. And, I, and I, was ta- I started talking to this one guy. And he says, so why are you out here? And I had that kind of that thought for a minute. I said, well, there's a lot of responses I could have here. <laughs> oh, that's a pretty good question. I said, look, here's the bottom line. I said, I want you to know the love of God. I say, you see all those people? I, I mean, they're here for you, but they're here because they love Jesus and they want you to know him. That's why they're here. That's why. Well, because we love Jesus. And everybody ought to know. So we don't believe that God is capricious. God's not spinning a wheel of misfortune. He doesn't have that. Some people think that whatever the that that if it happens, that must be the will of the will of God, and that that's just obvious. I talk to people all the time. Well, that just must be God's will that He shut this door. How do you know your mouth didn't shut that door? Anybody ever lost an opportunity because you said something dumb? (laughs) I'm not admitting it. God, God doesn't just heal some and make others sick. That idea is sick. That's not the nature of our loving Father. He's got nothing but good, nothing but, but love in, in still for anybody in all that will come to him. And he sent Jesus to prove it and to provide for it and to make a way. We don't believe that healing is just for the spirit of man. We believe absolutely in physical healing. Why is this so important? I'm telling you, you will back off. The last time that you saw your neighbor and they were limping out to their car. And you talked to them. And you had that thing on the inside that just said, maybe I should ask them if I can pray for them. And you didn't. We have to, honest be, I have to, we have to be honest with ourselves. What was that about? I remember a number of months ago, I was in a homeowners association meeting. And the president of our homeowners association board 
I joined the board. So I said, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, we'll do something in politics. I joined, I joined the board. Wow, it was an opportunity to meet people. So I'm, he, he was down in the back, stiff and sore. And a uh, uh, slip disc deal, kind of like what uh, Pastor Virgil had a few years ago. He had the herniated disc deal. And after the meeting, I had it in my place in my heart. I, you, need to, you, need to go, you need to go pray for him. You need to go ask him if he'll allow you to pray for him. I didn't do it. I did not do it. I allowed myself to be backed off of what I know to be truth and to be reality. Why do I allow yourself to be backed up? Because somewhere in there, all those little things that kept coming, if you don't keep it concreted and true with that place of surety, I know that I know that I know that the gospel uh, is the power of God unto salvation, the power of God unto healing, that Jesus died so that he would be free. I don't know what, I, I can lay hands on them and I can pray. Maybe nothing happens. Who, that's not my problem. But my, the reality is, is that it is my problem if I know the truth and I've allowed myself to be intimidated by circumstances or by lies that say, maybe, maybe not. Maybe not this time. Maybe not this place. Well, since then we rectified that. So... You don't have to pray for me too bad. <laughs> I met him on the street one Thursday afternoon and uh, he, was, he was taking new meds and I got to pray for him. There's a lot of other things we don't believe. We don't believe that healing's just for the millennium. We don't believe that God uses diseases and sicknesses to teach us stuff. We believe that the Holy Ghost is our teacher and that He's the teacher of all and uh, 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 of everybody. That he is teacher and, and, and He is the spirit of truth. And that's how God teaches us and instructs us. And sure, people can learn things while they're sick, but it's not God that, you know, and, and God will teach you things while you are sick, but it's not the sickness that is there to teach us. God's a much better teacher than that. Amen. There's a lot of things we, we, we uh, uh, um, again, that we need to be reminded of what we don't believe. Let's read Psalm 86 and we'll close. Verse 5 says, For you, Lord, are good and ready. <laughs> For you, Lord, are good and ready. It says ready to forgive. But you know, He's ready to heal. He's ready to bless. He's ready to love. He's ready to do whatever. For you, God, are good and you are ready. And you're abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. And I'm so thankful. It's just as easy as just calling upon Jesus. Just calling upon Jesus. Our healer. Our savior. Our provider. The lover of our souls. The light of the world. That whatever the circumstance. Whatever the situation. It really is just that easy. But it's our job. To make sure that we hold firm to that truth. Right? Because it's constantly, constantly getting eroded away. Eroded away every moment of every day. Every news call. Every person that you talk to. We've got to stay firm on that truth and that reality. Be faithful to share the truth. Be faithful to to contend and stand for the reality. Amen? 
And we will see wonderful, wonderful things happen. Praise God. Well, Father, I just come before you right now in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Lord, for the people of this church. I'm so blessed that we got people willing to go and share. And all the folk that were out in the, uh, uh, the park this last Sunday, I thank you for those who brought cookies to, to go to the jail. And for those who are going to go carol in the jail tomorrow. Why? Because they love you. And I thank you, Father God, that as we do, that we'll stand firm in the truth and the reality of your word. Because your, your word has not passed away. Not one promise, not one jot, not one till, not one thing has been done away. We thank you that you are still the God that heals today. You are still the God that delivers today. You are still the God that sets people free today. And I'm willing to be bold enough to just go stand out on the street and say, who will you have me minister to today? And when you speak to my heart, that I'll step out in faith and in boldness and take the word to those who are lost. Take the word to those who are sick. Take the word to those who don't have and just tell them the truth. And we thank you, Father, for allowing compassion to touch our hearts. In Jesus' name, we thank you for the season of healings coming forth in this area and in this place. is harvest time, and we will not back off. We will not be moved, for you are healer, and you have not changed. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.